and welcome to this week's Rugby League Back Chat. It has been a wild week in the world of Rugby League and we've got an hour to discuss it right now. We've got three very special people to do just that too. Starting with the owner of Lee Centurions, Derek Beaumont, the Chief Executive of Wakefield Trinity, Michael Carter, and leading player agent, Dave Peake. Gents, thanks for joining us. I think we could start in a million and one places today. Um, I want to talk first and foremost though, about some of the departures of coaches this week. Uh, we know for a fact that Leon Price has gone uh, from working to Richard Marshall's left Halifax and it would appear that Carl Forster is, is on his way out of Rochdale too. Derek, I'll come to you first. What do you make of the fact that three coaches gone in one week? It's very unlike rugby league, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you say coaches, you think more about buzzes, don't you, when they all come at once? <laughs> but uh, timing dictates itself, doesn't it, in business and, and in sport? You know, it's a results driven uh, industry, and, and, you know, the fans crave the results. And as, as uh, owners, we, uh, we also need the results. So I'm not too sure exactly uh, what's happened. I was quite surprised by the Richard Marshall one, I have to say, because I think he's done a fantastic job um, at Halifax, not just with the first team, but with. Uh, the youth and things that he's done there. So that was a bit of a shocker. Um, I, I know Mersh quite well, but I haven't spoke to him um, to find out. But mm -hmm. it's disappointing for people. But, you know, if, if you're not getting the results, you've got to make changes. Michael, I mean, have, have these departures come as a surprise? I mean, even Workington, <coughs> only two points off, off second, I think, when, when Leon left. It seemed like a, a peculiar timing as well. Yeah, I think particularly given the job that Leon did last year, you know, to... to uh, to get him up that league from where they were. I mean, I, I agree with Derek about Rich Marshall. I, I've been quite close to Rich and I, I texted him at the start of the week just saying, you know, you, you need to be really proud of the job you've done there because, like you say, it's not just about first team. Three three top four finishes, I think, in the last mm. four years. Um, but the reserve grade that they introduced and, and, you know, a lot of their reserve players have gone on to play first team. So, uh, without knowing the ins and outs, obviously, of that club, um, I, think, I think all three coaches need to still, you know, keep their heads held high because they've done fantastic jobs on what will be limited resources. Dave, obviously, Richard is, is a person that you know very well. I'm, I'm guessing it's been hard for him to take. Did it come as a shock to you as well when the, the call was made on Friday? It came as a shock. I mean, the main thing with Richard is he works so hard. I mean, he's a 70-hour-a-week he's man. And he does put so much time into it. And he's, I think his record stands with a very little budget for what he's had and to be as successful as he has been. And I think the thing with Richard, he's never going to... <laughs> He's always going to push on. He's a good coach. He's a young British coach, which I think is so, so important. And I just think there's a massive future in the game for him. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it'd be a big loss to see someone like him yeah. uh, go out of the game. He's definitely up and coming. He's somebody, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm happy with the, the great job Duffs is doing. But, you know, if he'd have been around on the market at the time when I was looking there, he's someone you'd certainly have in uh, and have a chat to. Whether or not his, his next role really might be good. He was at Warrington, weren't he, in, a, in a, a sort of assistant role, whether or not he's a number two at Super League and uh, has a look at that level for a bit and progresses. But I'm a bit surprised. That, I mean, I, I was very patient with Dukes here when, when we had a, a tough time because you've got to, you can't just look at the, the moment you're in there and then you've, I think you've got to give some credit for what someone's achieved mm -hmm. beforehand as well. They don't change as a person overnight. Yeah. And, and ultimately their preparation you know, ends once the, the players cross the whitewash and mm -hmm. there's got to be accountability with the players as well. And I wonder, you know, how much there's been a breakdown perhaps. Uh, there, very often that's what causes is the end is, is when players break down with the coach and they start coming speaking direct with owners and how it can be fixed. So, like I say, I, I don't know exactly what's happened, but, you know, I think they might have been better having a little bit more patience with Richard over the long term, uh, even if it meant they didn't make the four this year. The number of times he has, I think he was building them somewhere. Patience is a, is a massive factor, and, and Derek rightly says with, with Dukesy, you know, you were really patient with him. Unbelievably, last year, I had people, you know, kind of calling for Chris Chester's head at some point last year yeah. when... Now he's when on his we, way to Wigan, isn't well, he? <laughs> well, you know, money talks and all that. If, if Ian wants to get his checkbook out, I'm sure there's a deal to be done. Um, but, you know, you, you, it, it's like anything in sport, I guess, that, you know, you lose three or four on the trot and suddenly heads need to roll for some reason. And, you know, you, you've got to have loyalty. You've got to have patience to people because, you know, I want loyalty back. And not only with coaches, obviously, Chessie's come out this week and said, really happy at Wakefield and I know for a fact he is um, but even even with players to a certain extent you know I, I think we got the Tom Johnston uh, new deal over the line because of how loyal we'd been to him as he were coming up through the ranks mm. as well and improved and rewarded Tom as he came through so loyalty for me is absolutely massive in the game and whether it's coaches <clears throat> backfield staff off-field staff whoever it is I think 
I, I kind of want loyalty out of my staff and I want to give them loyalty back as well. Dave, Derek alluded to the fact that it is a results-based business and sometimes you've got to make those decisions. But surely as well, longevity in a coach and having a coach in place for a long amount of time is going to help produce more success given the salary cap and how they recruit their own players and so much. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a big call, isn't it, to change a, a coach in this sport? If you look at historically over the last three or four seasons, Halifax have been late starters mm -hmm. and they've come into the game quite late and they've got to the, the four or mm -hmm. wherever they've gotten to. And they've done an amazing job. He's done an amazing job there. And he's been very, let's say, thrifty with some of his buys and his sales and he's done, brought his youth through and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But what I just can't quite understand with, with rugby league in general Sometimes, I admire Derek for what he did with Neil Dukes and he stayed with him and obviously chesie has been there quite a while at Wakey. But sometimes you've just got to see the bigger picture for me and just, just hang on a little bit. I mean, what's the need to panic right now? I mean, how many points are they on? Is it 12 points or so? Mm. Well, they, I, think they, I think the two points off the play... Oh, no, the, yeah, the, no, the four points off the playoffs. Um, but we're halfway through the season. Mm. Yeah, and I, I personally do think that I think he should have been given a longer time to, to, yeah. to progress. I think the, the the other thing is as well, like picking up on what Michael said there about loyalty, is that also when you're trying to recruit a coach, if you've got a record of potting a coach quite easily yeah. when he has a little bit of a bad form, <laughs> you're going to struggle to recruit the right kind of coaches. And players as well get very close to coaches as well. And it's quite an insular kind of thing in the dressing room there. And, you know, they feel a little bit aggrieved about how they're performing and how they're letting him down. And, you know, if, you, if you're just too erratic with it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we played Halifax early in the season, <clears throat> round two or three, uh, and they turned us over. They went uh, quite well ahead of us. And I think the other thing is as well to consider is the brand of rugby Richard was playing. Because exactly. he was playing bad. nice uh, rugby. Yeah. You know, even going back to uh, when we was in the eights with uh, Rolls and they, they, they beat us quite comprehensively at their place, which yeah. kind of started to spell the end for us in, in those eights, the way they shut us down. I think he's an intelligent uh, coach and a, and a decent person and a decent role model. What I find quite surprising as well is, on the score of Richard there, is it was only two weeks previous to that they beat a Super League club in the Challenge Cup. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't see the sense in why you would do that. You give somebody a little bit longer and just see how they roll a little bit. But if you look at, like, for, for example, with uh, Cal Foster, he's another guy, he's a good British coach, he's coming mm -hmm. through. I mean, he's, again, I don't know how he does it at times. He holds a job, I think, as an electrician, he runs a family, he plays rugby and he coaches as well. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something there where that ball can be just left to coach or maybe getting a system somewhere. Mm -hmm. That guy's got a chance, surely. Yeah. Are, we, are we seeing clubs panic because of the finance? I mean, in League One, you look at the fact that New York and Ottawa look to be coming in. And if you don't get promoted this year, that it looks like it's going to be very, very difficult for a few years. Likewise, if you go down like Rochdale look like they could do, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for them to get back up. So is it... Michael, maybe a bit of, of panic among clubs that they're, they're making these calls so early? I think undoubtedly the, the bottom line has to be that the decision's being made because of financial reasons. So, uh, like, like Derek said, we played Halifax two or three years back in the Challenge Cup. I went on record as saying it was the most entertaining game I'd seen all year. Yeah, Halifax absolutely threw the ball around. They played great stuff. And I think that's what... Richard has tried to get into his teams, like Chesie does, you know, probably like John Duffy does as well, yeah, you know. Yeah. And we've got to we've got to get past this result being the be all and end all. And I say it to fans all the time, they get hung up about referees and the result going against us. Have you enjoyed the game? If you've not watched the referee and you've watched us play, have you enjoyed the game? And ninety nine percent of the time I think we try to play an attractive brand of, of rugby and other teams do as well. And that's where we've got to get to because it's an entertainment business at the end of the day. So there's gotta be it's gotta be down to finances. It's, you know, in some way, shape or form, it's gotta be down to finances. Derek, in regards to recruitment, when you get rid of a coach, you know, this time of the year, how does it how difficult is it then to work on that when you work into a salary cap? They've obviously retained some of the players they want to, to keep, they might have already got some players that they want to sign up. So how, mm. how difficult is it to, to, to sort that part of the business when you're changing the coach? Well, it's th that's what's the most surprising about it because if, if somebody's made a decision to move somebody on or, or you can see that that's where you're wanting to go and you'll have planned you know, for that, not just the financial implications, but identified your targets. But when you see a coach of that stature moved on and two players who are playing in the game having to look after things, you wonder what's actually gone on that, that's caused it. But it, it does become difficult, and, and believe it or not, there's not that many people out there actually apply for your posts when you've got them. You're more trying to find things. People think you get all these CVs in and you're sifting through them. You don't really get any. Um, you know, I mean, I was, Neil actually left uh, in, in the end. It just 
become insurmountable for him. Um, and I was on the phone to different places, Australia, various things, trying you know, agents, trying to find out what op options uh, are available. And very often you end up looking within. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a good assistant, like we were fortunate enough with Kieran Pertle, you can, um, you know, steady it up there. But money's a big thing. People always say, with you know, fans will be like, you know, get Jukesy out, get Jukesy out. And you think, well, who's paying Jukesy out? Because, you know, if he's on... Yeah you know, let's just say 60 grand a year, yes. you've got to pay him anyway. He's not going to just walk for nothing. And then you need another coach. So where's the 60K come from? Unless you, you know, you're going to tip it in yeah. uh, yourself or do you reduce a player for it? So it's a big fine balancing act. I think, Matt, the, the bit that you picked up on there, the, the uh, New York and Ontario bids, mm -hmm. I think that's causing an immense amount uh, of pressure mm -hmm. uh, on owners in the, in the clubs at the bottom of the championship and trying to get out. Uh, of Championship One, and also in in terms of the the Super League clubs at, at the bottom end, who could be vulnerable to coming down in the Championship mm -hmm. uh, clubs, who want to get up because they're going to come in with lots of money, and it is about money. Mm -hmm. Players get a short period of time in their life mm -hmm. that they can earn money from the sport, and you can't criticise them or their agents for getting them the best deals mm -hmm. uh, that they can. So if those two two teams come in and they're flooding it uh, with money, they're going to attract the players, and naturally that will get them a, a better team and progress up and it's going to cause uh, cause issues. And I think that's making boardrooms have a little bit um, of a panic under a little bit more pressure than they otherwise would look at it controlled. There's one one key word in, in what Derek's just come out there for me, lucky. So, mm. you, you know, get John Duffy, getting lucky with it. I got absolutely lucky with, Ch with, with Chris Chester, yeah. the timing of it. You know, he'd, he'd just left Hall KR. We then lost our coach. Everything panned together. And he, he got the ethos of the club, but we undoubtedly got lucky with it. And when you're picking a head coach, there's a massive element of that that you've just got to be lucky with who you actually end up yeah. going with because uh, they all come out with the right things when, when, you, when you're talking to them. They all, you know taught the game well and, and all that sort of thing. But you, you've got to have luck on your side as well. It's massive. And I think it's a lot of the support. Sorry, Dave. I think it's a lot of the support about a club as well in general because if, if you take Chesley, for example, they of highly rate, he was struggling at, at OKR at that point in time when they you know, pulled the plug on, yeah. on that one. And look how well he's, he's done yeah. for you. So you know, there's an element of the whole club, the support you get from your, your owner or your chief exec, your chairman, um, the, the support staff and everything else that becomes around it. Because for me, the most important part of any rugby league club is recruitment. Mm -hmm. So it, it's simply <clears> that, you know, you get your recruitment right. The success is with the teams who've got the best players because they've recruited them, they've identified them. They're not, they're, you know, it's not names winning games. They're not necessarily chucking the checkbook because we're all governed by salary cuts. Mm -hmm. It's just identifying the right people that work for your club as well yeah. as a culture. Yeah. And the coach is obviously... Uh, pivotal in that. So when sometimes a coach comes in and inherits people, how is he necessarily going to do a better job with them? He's under immediate pressure because he's coming into a pressure pot situation that somebody's had to get out of. So has he got to immediately get results? And you generally find to go outside of rugby, like with you know Solskjaer at United, you generally find the players respond quickly in the first mm -hmm. instance. And then eventually that can just peter Subsides. away and yeah. it wanes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you saw it with Halifax, they got a good win away at, yeah, at Sheffield. Yeah. Yeah. Going so the case. But it, it, you expect that. Yeah. Uh, it's how that then uh, carries on. So there's, there's definitely an element well, of I luck mean, and time. The question I'd ask there, I mean, it's like two guys, two owners, or two clubs there. If you look at some of the young British coaches coming through, people like, let's say, Richard, for example, Kieran Pirtle's another one, et cetera, et cetera. Why do a lot of clubs not give the chances to these younger fellas? You were very brave in what you did. You give Chesley a chance and he's, I think he's blossomed and he's only, I think he's a very good man manager. Mm. He's a good bloke to, to speak to. Uh, you did very well with yourself with your coaches. You give young British coaches chance. But why do a lot of teams, why will they not give the younger fellas? Why will they not invest into the young British fellas? Oh, I'm speaking for a whole lot of owners here. I, I can only speak from my experience. I've had an Australian coach and... Um, we kind of all know how that ended as well, so it was a frosty end to that. I I don't see myself going uh, down an Australian route again. Um, I'm hoping I'm never having to pick another head coach in my life. Yes, that means that Chessie's outlasted me. Um, you talk about Kieran Pertle. Uh, twice I interviewed Kieran, and, and I've said this to Kieran, so it's, it, I'm not speaking out of school here. Twice he was very unlucky that he was probably the next one that uh, I would have gone for after picking yeah. who I did pick. So I think like yourself, there's a lot of young English coaches that know our game inside out. And for clubs like ours, we need to be fishing in the championship to find our next players. We're not going to go to Australia and pay 
half a million pounds or whatever it is for Gareth Widdop. That's clearly not happening for our club. Yeah. We've got to find players out there. We took a punt on Keegan Hurst, who's yeah. done great for us for two years. Um, you know, and I think Chelsea can spot that player as well. He's got a good grasp of the of the championship and below. You know, we we, we picked up James Batchelor from Cat Three Academy Rugby. Um, and, you know, he's in the England he's Knights now. Team. Yeah, absolutely. So, for me, young and English would suit our club or does suit our club absolutely yeah. down to the ground. I, mean, I think a, a lot of other clubs need to start thinking I, like that. I, I, I do seriously think there's some seriously good coaches in, in the division. I mean, yeah. people like Steve Price, he's shown his worth now, and Justin, obviously. Mm. Uh, there's some really, really good coaches out there. Yeah. But I, I just think there's so much that the, the game doesn't look at below in the Championship in League One mm -hmm. and beyond that. Dave, let me just... Stop you there, because we're going to have a quick break. We'll come back to this straight after the break. Fascinating stuff in the first part. So stay with us. We'll be talking about much more rugby league coming right up after this short break. You've spoken and we've listened. Rugby League Back Chat is available on podcast form from all your best podcast providers. If you're on a trip down the M62 or a flight to Toronto or Toulouse, download Rugby League Back Chat for the best debate inside Rugby League. Welcome back to this week's edition of Rugby League Back Chat. Before the break, we were getting right stuck into the whole coaching debate that's going on. Dave, you were making a, a valid point about young British coaches. Yeah, I was just saying about the young British coaches, I just think there's a lot beyond Super League. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fellas down in the Championship and League One that need to be seriously looked at mm -hmm. and, and, and beyond. Uh, there's even stuff going on there in the universities and things like that too that need to be, I suppose, challenged as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe a lot of Super League clubs could possibly link up with the universities to actually put some of their coaches in there to bring the youth through there too. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the, the key, Dave, is it, it's like we was going back to before, it's the pressure, it's the pressure on results and experience is something we'd all always go for in any kind of recruitment. You always look for people with experience, with a proven track record and I think at the elite level that's something that's not going to you know, really change. The old question is, you know, how do you get experience if no one gives you a chance? Yeah. So I, th I think for me, people like Kieran Pirtle and, and Richard Marshall and, and and Carl Foster and even Leon Price. I think, you know, if they get in and learn from your people, of you, you're just in all books and price. I know you had a bad experience with an Aussie. We've had good ones with Turks and, and Millward and uh, other clubs have and other clubs have had, had bad ones. So I would always like to see us promote uh, British coaches. But a lot of people as well have a misconception about coaching that it's all to do with the technical um, side of it when actually the head coach really yeah. isn't necessarily that embroiled in that. So you can bring some of the intelligent people like Kim Pirtle's really, really smart at, at you know his, his rugby side of things and how he analyses things. Paul Anderson is you know a lot of people don't think anything of him. He's a real good up and coming uh, coach and, and his knowledge and what he sees and how he reviews games. It's brilliant to watch and see how different coaches do it and the, how they see it. But the biggest part of actual coaching is the man management. Yeah. Of, yeah, of the beast, and we're talking about big guys with yeah. big characters, some yeah. of them a bit loose. It's managing that culture, explaining to them why you're not playing and yeah. what you want out of them and being able to back it up. Yeah. Because every week, if you've a squad of 25 or, or even more at, at Super League, you know, there's eight plus players that have trained hard all week, that have got their own opinion, that want to be playing, they're getting told uh, they're not. And likewise, when you're getting dropped. And I think that managing those expectations mm -hmm. is the bigger part and I think that definitely comes off um, the perception a player has of, of you and, and what you've achieved in the game, whether it's playing it or the success you've had as, as a coach. And I think that makes it harder for you 
your up and coming guys. So I think link them in. The, this thing now with the reserves and the under 18s, I think they're the ideal areas for yeah. people to yeah, grow progress. through and, and prove it. But yeah. we should as a club, and certainly it's got to come from Super League. That's where everybody aspires to be, bringing these people in and nurturing yeah. them with the likes of your Price and Oldbrook and that that are yeah. proving themselves over here. Yeah. Right, again, so we, sorry, just to finish yeah. out, you've seen him with Rich Marshall as well. You've seen him on Sky at Cass. You know, stood next to Dowell Powell. He's mm -hmm. gone to learn in a different environment as well, mm -hmm. even when he's head coach of, of Halifax. Yeah. So there's definitely a desire there from Richard isn't there, to, yeah. to improve himself and keep going throughout the game. I think he's, he'll, he'll be back in the game before too long. Right, gents, we're going to have to move on because we've got loads to talk about. I want to pick up on a point you made, Derek, about New York and, and Otter and how they're going to affect the player market. Um, mm. We've got an agent here today, which is quite handy. So, mm. Dave, from, from your perspective, New York and Otter, it looks like they're going to come in. There's this meeting in the next couple of weeks, which will basically green green ticket. How is that going to affect the market from, from your point of view? Is it going to raise the salaries of, of players naturally because there's two more clubs with a bit of money throwing cash around or...? Or will it be slightly different to that in your eyes? The big thing that's going to happen with these two clubs is how much they've got to spend. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. Toronto have basically gone in with an open checkbook and they've put a squad together that's a Super League squad, if you like. Mm -hmm. It depends with Ottawa and New York whether they're going to do that and how much the spend has not been said, how much they're going to spend yet. But they're going to have to start looking at like certain players in certain areas. They've got to be a certain player to go out to Ottawa, mm -hmm. a certain player to go out to New York, because Toronto have already found taking numerous players that just haven't quite worked. The chemistry has not been correct for them. So realistically, it is going to be about money and it's going to be about the right, the right way to do things. Now, it depends what they're going to spend. Now, they could spend anything from £15,000 to £80,000 on the player. But the thing is, they've just got to get the chemistry right more than anything. But what it is probably going to do, unfortunately for a lot of clubs over here, it is going to put prices up. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's the, the top and bottom of what's going to happen, really, Matt. Is that fair? I, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't really voiced an opinion on, on these two new bids. I'll do it here and now. I, I don't think it should be happening, uh, personally. I don't think there's, you know, I expressed to Ralph when I was asked about it, all you're going to do is weaken our game's player pool. You're going to be taking the top championship players, you're going to be taking the, the middle bot men, super league players who've got an appetite to go and have a look at that abroad, who are interested in And that's not a criticism of the players who want to look at that lifestyle and who want to get 20 grand more than Michael's prepared to give them because they only get a short time to do it. So I think it's going to weaken our uh, competitions um, whilst we put people out there, if you will, and ultimately, at, at the end of the day, we're going to see clubs fail in here. And I said to Ralph, well, what's your expectation? What's the end game here? Do you want Toulouse, Catalan, Ontario, Toronto and New York all in Super League with half a dozen of our best clubs in it? And it was like, well, no, um, we'll have a limit on how many overseas clubs can be in Super League. So that's just going to stifle promotion and relegation then, because if you've got you know, Ontario and New York with money, and let's say you've got only two clubs can be up and it's Catalan and Toronto, they're going to be sat at the top of the championship all the time and not being able to get in because, you know, they're not allowed. And then that's leaving the bottom Super League club staying in because the team that was promoted can't come in. Yeah. So I just don't think, as, as with Rugby League in general, I don't think it's all been completely ironed out and thought out and bottomed out. Um, I've also heard um, from, you know, whether it's reliable or unreliable sources, that actually um, there's no, you know, nobody's saying there's the money, that's everything. I believe once they've got the uh, franchise approved, then they're going to try and sell the bid to get people to invest in it, okay. rather than <coughs> coming with, here we go, here's a group of people, here's Michael Carter, Dave Pete, Derek Beaumont, business people with money and experience of rugby league, they're setting up this club in New York, there's two million quid that they're investing into it, this is how much they'll spend on players each year for the three years, and let's go with that. I don't think I've seen uh, or heard enough of that um, mm -hmm. to justify doing it. I think we've got to grow the game. I understand that. But I think we, you know, we need to deal with what we've got here first. There's a lot of clubs in the championship. I think where we was heading with the middle eights was almost towards two Super League uh, tens, mm -hmm. you know, rather than a Super League 14 that it might go to. And I think that would have been the way to, to get to. Mm -hmm. And then your third to your, your champ one. Yeah. So that ultimately you could have, you know, five, six, seven overseas clubs filter between them, uh, vying for promotion and relegation and two full-time teams. Right, you give me loads to discuss there. Uh, let's pick up on the first point you made um, about how, how they're going to affect player pools and, and, and so on and so forth. How much time do we, realistically, the Toronto or the New York, the Waterloo need to develop their own players and 
bolster the player pool so that they're not just picking players out of out of the heartland areas? Well, let's look at the example we've already had over mm -hmm. the last 10 years, yeah. Catalan Dragons. Mm -hmm. They were, <laughs> in, uh, I'm led to believe, obviously I wasn't at the table at the time, they were, they were let in on the basis of an improved TV deal, mm -hmm. an improvement of the international French team. Yeah. I think we can both say that those two things haven't happened. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have built a, a successful, if we want to call it, franchise where there's eight to 10,000 fans turning up every week. Fans love going across there. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, th there's a tick in the box for Catalans, but the caveats that they didn't really meet the two criteria that they were coming in on. If we're looking at the, the, the Canadian model now, Dave's, Dave's absolutely right that it's caused wage inflation throughout the game. Um, and my issue with it is where are these players going to come from? Uh, are we going to give them 10 or 15 years whereby at the end of that, there's got to be only seven overseas players mm -hmm. in that squad? And when I mean overseas, the rest of them are going to be Canadian mm -hmm. or, or Americans if it's New York. Is that the end game for us? And then we're increasing the player pool mm -hmm. and we've actually got 25 or 50 Canadians if there's two, mm -hmm. two squads over there that can make a Canadian national team and improve yeah. the international game. Is that the end game for us? I don't know. The, like you say, it's probably not been readily discussed out of the open of what the end game is. On the flip side of that, we saw that Toronto got 9,500 on, on Sunday for the game. Do you believe that? I do, actually. Well, it's quite surprising, I actually, because I, I went out to Toronto two years ago to, to go and meet them and discuss players, etc. on the back of that. We've got a few players over there. And I think that we played. Bar I think they played Barra Toronto that day, and they said there was about five on, five and a half, six. And I, I found it quite surprising actually, because when I walked on and saw him, I thought, ah, there's about three thousand on here, really? something like that. But I must admit, 15, 20 minutes from the end of the game, I thought, yes, there is, mm. because they, they treat it like American football. Mm. They actually just come sauntering in at all silly times with a hot dog and a, mm. a pie. And it's quite good to watch actually. They just, you saw uh, that on Sunday night though. There was a whole yeah. stream of people just walking along the stands, yeah. going into the end. So they actually and, clock and come uh, in know. later on. So yeah, but the, the, the capacity of that stadium is nine thousand six hundred. Yeah. And the, so they're saying they're under short capacity and I'm watching, they only show you one stand, which is a concrete block and it's not even half full. One end of the sticks is full of gazebos, mm -hmm. which has got people that are like a mini beer festival. The other end of the sticks can't hold anybody. So I look at Lee, we had 9,000 against St. Helens or 9,200, whatever it was, with all four sides open. The north stand sold out, the south stand sold out, the west stand almost sold out, the east stand. That's not visible though. Mm. You know, if you get a, I was having this conversation with somebody who was messaging me yesterday, I'm on social media, as you know, and I said, just print off that stand and get a bingo blotter and blot everyone's head and count mm. it. There's no way is the nine and a half thousand people. Is it, is it easy? I mean, you, you two will be able to tell me, is it easy to, to make up attendances? Is that, is. is that possible? Well, <laughs> it's an internal procedure, isn't it? It'll be the it's same as your You can say what you want, can't yeah, you? Who's the monitor in it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. he, he, uh, look, I, I get the, the, the reason why they would they would want to do it, but I think they just need to be a bit smarter with the numbers that they're plucking out of the air, you know, because to say nine and a half thousand, you never get to see. I messaged one of their players yesterday and said, the stand that you run out towards that it's filmed from is the people in that, because mm -hmm. they never show it. Mm. And if there's not, there's only 3,000 at that game yeah. tops. Yeah. And I won't name the person, but he said they're massively overinstating. Yeah. Most people aren't paying to get in and so on. I think the stand they run out against on, uh, on Sunday, Derek, that, that was... Pretty full that one. You could, you could see that. That's where the, the, the sort of coaches sit and stuff. And I would, uh, I would the one they filmed say, from. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty full that one. It's pretty full. There are one. pictures on social media, aren't there, of yeah. of the ground. But to the more to the point. So the com the commercial, let's call it commercial potential. They've got they've got Championship Rugby on Sky, which other than Summer Bash, we don't see. The potential that what they can bring financially does that not make mean that we need to give them some time to prove what they can do, or is it too big a risk? Dave, I'll come to you first and foremost on that one. I think Toronto's, a, I mean, it must be quite hard for these two fellas here because realistically they, they, they are British clubs. Um, Toronto, they do things in a different way completely. I mean, from the experience I've had with them and stuff like that. I don't think it's particularly all about numbers in the ground for them. They have other things that they're going to sort of start marketing and things mm -hmm. like that in the future, which all a bit about a brand about the Wolf Pack. Mm -hmm. And I think they're looking at the side of a bigger picture and they're looking for things like TV rights and other brandings and stuff mm. like that, which I'm led to believe is very close close by now. Um, and it's just a different concept completely mm. where I think it's refreshing for the game, but I do fully understand, I do agree with Derek and Michael that 
you know, you've got to have some scepticism there about yeah, what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Ottawa is another thing that's going to come on. What happens if and when Toronto get into Super League? Mm -hmm. What happens to the championship then? Because it's going to leave a bit of a void. There's going to be no championship teams on TV. Mm -hmm. It's going to go back to what it was once a year. And I do worry for the championship a little bit. Mm -hmm. They use it as a stepping stone to get into Super League and that's the way business goes. But my main worry is the championship. Mm. See, I, I think you've got, I mean, I, I've I had my David Argyle, I admire anybody that puts serious money uh, into rugby league. I think what he's been prepared to put in, the challenges that he's had to face, paying for the flights and mm -hmm. et cetera, and paying Sky to film uh, things. You know, whether the Summer Bash this year would have been filmed without their input for, the, for paying for their game for the uh, broadcast rights. So I'll get that out there straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they've proven themselves in terms of how quickly they've escalated. You know, they've, they've, they've won the championship, won at a canter, uh, then the, the championship probably fell short in, in, in the, you know, by their own admissions with how, how they got it. They were probably too concerned about how they started and going unbeaten than how they finished. And I think this time round, there'll be more about being right at the end of it mm -hmm. and, be, and be tough to beat when it gets to that point. Whilst they're not firing no great, and that could get my attention and think, hey, you know what, mm -hmm. I might actually change my, my mindset here. Mm -hmm. But I think the way they'll finish at the end. So I, th I think we should just spend more time letting the Toronto model continue, see what happens if and when they do get into Super mm -hmm. League, which I think they probably will. Uh, this time round, see how the Super League clubs find the travelling over there mm -hmm. and how it fits, and just learn from that. I think then's the time that you can think, hey, hang on, let's have a look at Ontario, let's have a look at New York, because mm -hmm. the biggest thing is my criticism of Toronto is it's it's English or Australian is is players that would play in Super League and Championship, mm -hmm. training over here for half of the year, playing over here for <coughs> half of the year, and then nipping over there to play in front of a, a, a number of people that ain't even paying to get in. Yeah. Words the players that have been brought through. They had one Canadian player and then removed him because they said he was counted as a quota player. Is it realistic to think, though, that Toronto or, or New York or, or Ottawa can produce players just like that that are going to be able to play at that level? Or, or no, uh, and that's why I'm saying with the Catalans money, you look at 10, 15, yeah, 10, yeah, 15 yeah. years. If, if, if we're going to commit to that, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, we're saying here's the end game in 15 years' time, you've got to be at a point where there's. 20 Canadians and seven overseas players within mm -hmm. your squad. That's your target, plus a TV deal, plus everything else that you can bring to the table. There's your targets, off you go and run it. And then we live with that. We, we say, well, that's your targets, go and get them. You know, I, 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 there, are, there are issues with Toronto, I think, logistically still. Uh, integrity wise and you know, one of my one of my great critics and out there Andrew Charm has actually made a, a really valid point in the in the last couple of weeks you know they've they've got to go to Toronto this week whereas other clubs have played them in this country mm. and even at the weekend there was snow on the ground in mm. Toronto even you know the game was played but there's still snow on the ground so there's issues around fixturing all that sort of thing where we've got to have a level playing field because otherwise you're going to have owners that that won't live with an uneven playing field. You know, it's hard yeah. enough for us as it is. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to stop you yeah. because we are we are running out of time in this second part. We're gonna have to take a quick break when we're coming back and discussing all of this and much more on rugby league back chat. Stay right here. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Rugby League back chat. I very rudely interrupted Michael uh, so we could get to a quick break. You were making the point about some logistical yeah, issues. Yeah, I think, I think there's there's still um, things that need to be ironed out in that. Uh, I've not been to Toronto. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Derek has. Um, 
you know, they talk about the travel over there, um, you know, premium economy seats and, and all that sort of thing. You know, we've, we've got some we've got some big lads in our team that uh, <laughs> that, that need some room. Uh, you know, so I think I think there's that issue. And I think for me as well, and this isn't a go at Toronto, it's a it's, it's a go at any club that's in the professional environment. Sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that if I <laughs> drop off this chair right now, Wakefield Trinity carries on because the, the business is sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're throwing three, four, five million pounds into a, t into a club and suddenly get bored, where's that club end up? It's not going anywhere, is it? And, you know, I think I think probably Derek, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, has seen both sides of that because yeah. you went through a period where you were throwing your own money into Lee and absolutely your right to spend that. And then you've kind of, I know we've talked, you've gone a bit full circle and now that's, that's less money being thrown into it, but more sustainable business for Lee. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I, there's no money going into it yeah. for me this year. I mean, it's underpinned by me if it works that way, but mm -hmm. I, I reversed it back to, um, you're quite right. And look, I got advice to just do what Witness did and, and you know, just chuck it away, etc. But I wasn't prepared to do that. So I fought through it. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's all right to come in and say, I'm going to spend a couple of million of my own money, try and make this work. And then when it doesn't, just leave disarray. Mm. That's yep. not right and yep. proper. And I'm all about, you know, being right and proper when, when I put my head on my pillow, if I feel that that's, yep. I've done right, then I can live with that. So it was a case of scaling it down and, and we did exactly that. We got that club to, it hadn't sold any season tickets, any sponsorship mm -hmm. or anything. And it had its December final payment to come from the Super League yep. um, parachute and the RFL distribution, uh, which was significantly more than its wages for the December, all on one year contracts. And that was leaving the club for me to be able to, to go away from if somebody else wanted to take it. And then all its income's in, so it's got plenty of money in the bank. It's probably, you know, we, I, I won't speak out of turn here, Michael, but all, all clubs, I think, really in the game, we're living off season ticket money that we sell to yeah. keep going historically because it's always been the case. So that was the first time the club's had a complete start with loads of money, all its season ticket and sponsorship money, sat there to draw down on throughout the rest of the year. And, and quite rightly so, you know, the amount of money that, David Argyle or whoever else is investing in Toronto that it needs. If, as as we're seeing now, you know, players saying they're not getting paid on time and things all changing and everybody having to fly home straight after the game instead of that extra night and normal economy seats. Understandably, the guy's getting you're feeling a bit battered and bruised and it's not quite looking how he's expecting it on the pitch. No doubt he's a bit nervous about how things are going at the moment uh, and the change that they've had. And if he does decide, you know, they didn't get up this year and, and that was that, then it would be uh, catastrophic. I admire what you do because you've got a club that is sustainable and I think you always punch way above your weight where you get. And that's where my club sat now. But it opens up a greater debate in terms of promotion and relegation for me as well, that we've 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 seen two clubs in the past couple of years in Lee and Widnes get relegated. And Lee were averaging six and a half thousand mm -hmm. in Super League. Widnes were probably at, at four and a half, but had had a really sort of poor spell. Where, and, and you've seen how their fans have bounced back. That's 12,000 fans in the heartlands that everybody kind of sort of dismisses mm -hmm. because we, you know, we're, we're called dinosaurs or archaic because we want to try and protect Heartland fans and yeah. you know we, we can't we can't get away from well, the fact I'll, that it's a northern sport that the, the basis of the sport mm -hmm. is in the north. I throw the question to you then, Derek. Should should we revise promotion relegation? Should we get rid of promotion relegation? I don't think that that's not something I would ever uh, be a big fan of. You know, I, I think for me, I thought the Middle Eights worked right, and and I think we was heading somewhere with it. It wasn't perfect, and there was issues and. And at the same time as I say that, I would definitely have been out of the sport if that was the only way to get promoted because you've got to put a million, a million and a half quid into a championship club to be able to beat a Super League club. So once that changed, I thought, oh, hang on, I can stay in here. I can scale it down, let Toronto get out of the way. And then if I want to have another crack at it, uh, I can. But if you close promotion and relegation, you, you send people like myself and anybody else who's prepared to come in the game and put money into it, out of out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, I know Super League um, are obviously looking at the, the whole picture and when I was in there and voted in favour of you know what I did with the RFL which was against my club's best interest mm -hmm. really for where we was heading back to the championship which is controlled by them uh, but I thought it was right for the, the sport um, and you know they'll have their own idea because it is about attendances, it is about facilities, it is about you know what you can sell to the uh, the TV rights yeah. um, 
So, I, I, but I do think there's got to be some form of a way to gain entry into Super League to be able to have aspiration and to make the, the weaker teams in Super League have to, to fight and not just rest on the laurels. So what's the Super League stance on it, Michael? I think I think what Derek said there is where we're sat, that there the, the feels like there needs to be a way into Super League. I'm not sure the Super 8s, Middle 8s was the way. I felt that everybody kind of scrambled to get into the 8 at the, you know, we, we not that we chucked the Challenge Cup away, but uh, my priority with Chesney was always, let's get in the 8s first, mm -hmm. secure where we're at, and then we'll, we'll see what we can do in the rest of the season. The fact that the Super 8s aren't here this year, <laughs> notwithstanding a, a huge injury list, we've said we'd like to have a really good go at the Challenge Cup this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, you know, it gives you different priorities. Having said that, I'm not a massive believer in, in the straight one-up, one-down. I think uh, uh, some sort of grand final at the end of it or a playoff between bottom and top and, you know, let's, uh, let, let's, let's try and create an event. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we've, we've got to get more events into our game. Um, I, I'm not sat here saying I've got all the answers because I haven't. I just, I just know that we've seen two clubs that have gone through a massive mm -hmm. upheaval um, because they had the misfortune to finish bottom and, you know, Lee probably had 10, 12 injuries that year and that, that sort of thing can curtail anybody's season. Yes. You know, you go through uh, an injury list of 15 players and you're in trouble and, and it can happen to anybody. Well, we didn't even finish bottom, we finished next well, to bottom, yeah, didn't exactly, we? Yeah, exactly, yeah. With witness and, and I remember, you know, identifying a situation and I, I paid out, um, you know, Dane Weston and, and another player to clear some spots, uh, Willie Tonga, um, to clear some spots, brought in Dan, Daniel Mortimer, Sammy Sony Lange, about four players, put the money in, mm. 100k, um, to change that and both Sammy Sony and, and Marks got injured in the first game against witness yeah. in the eight, so they... You know, yeah. you can't foresee that. Um, and I genuinely believe, which is why I'm still around, that Lee does have something to add to, to mm. Super League Rugby. Uh, the facility it's got, the fan base it's got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I believe it can contribute and did contribute and off the field in amongst the Super League owners. I felt we offered yeah. uh, contribution at that table. So, you know, it's a shame again for Witness, you know, a super club. Um, we have got to grow. We have got to look outside the box. I think another year of having a look at Toronto how they handle Super League if they get in, how Super League feel about the travel and all the logistics, mm -hmm. to then see whether we bring more in. I just think it's too soon to try and add uh, to that business do not, model. Do you not feel, though, looking back, you just sort of saying the season that Lee finished one from bottom, mm -hmm. when this came bottom, if you looked at the one-up, one-down system that you've got now, would you still be in Super League now? Well, we'd still be in Super League, and I believe we would have kicked on uh, from that as well, mm -hmm. because it just basically chopped our legs off of anything to do with academies and um, you know the the youth side that we wanted to try and build that you know Kieran was going to have a big big part of so it, it set us back um, I believe we'd have kicked on and, and probably improved we made a big mistake you know the way we dealt with it we had the parachute payment we should have just got rid of a few of the players um, and not changed too much um, and you know hindsight's a wonderful thing. Mm, um, we, we we ripped it apart and got our recruitment wrong and paid the price. Dave, I'm going to come to you in one minute just to go on to another topic. But Derek, just quickly, you mentioned earlier that you're not putting mo any money into Tlee at the minute, but you may be. I think you said in your statement back at the end of last year you may be tempted if you saw things were going well. Mm -hmm. um, I know Greg McNally came in on the, the squad builder. Ryan Browley's come in. Jay Kemet's come in. So are you yeah. now putting a little bit of money in, or are you well, still distancing it, yourself? This, the, Look, the, the fans, the, the fans are the, are, the, are the people that make the biggest contribution to that club at the moment. Mm. So, you know, the, the season tickets that they bought and the attendances, because I wanted to wear on the side of caution and wasn't prepared to put money in, I sat down with, you know, Mike Laban, Steve Openshaw, Jason, all, all the rest of our guys, Steve Hill, and we sat down and went through a budget of what we thought was realistic. Mm. And I wouldn't have any more than a crowd of like 16, 1700 paying. Um, budgeted for because yeah. that's kind of where it was at the end when it was, you know, struggling. Yeah. So that had to be our starting point. The fans have been outstanding. We've been getting 3,000 crowds. So naturally, looking at that progressing forward, rather than get to the end of the season and be sat with money in the bank, which arguably then doubles up for the year after, which is when it's best to spend it. Mm -hmm. If Toronto are out of the way and there's nobody spending money, um, I thought, well, let's just increase our chances, keep the crowds coming. Uh, by uh, adding to it. So I'm underpinning the fact that it might get to later in the months where I have to put money in and I'm prepared mm -hmm. to do that. You know, I'm not entering agreements with people mm -hmm. that, are, that are, you know, I won't honour. So 
I'm hoping I don't have to put too much in. By the same token, I'm sat here with all five or seven NFT quota spots, mm -hmm. plenty of room on the salary cap and the resources to spend it if I decide to do so. Yeah. So, you know, I'll also see how it's going. And if I think, do you know what, these players are available and, and with those, I think I can uh, turn Toronto over and get in Super League this year, then that's still an option open to me. And, and it's, uh, it's not like any other business. This is, it's unbelievably hard to budget for a rugby yeah. league club. I so I'll imagine. give you an example that we've gone through in the last month with all our injuries that we had Ben Reynolds out on loan and we had Lee Kershaw out on loan and that's money flowing into the club. Mm. Had to withdraw them players back. You're still paying your injured players. Not only that, your medical bills have gone through the roof. Yeah. So it's absolutely blown our, our budget apart for this yeah. last couple of months. And I'm sat there like Derek. You know, we 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 plan to break even for this year, mm -hmm. but safe in the knowledge that I've got myself and another couple of guys on the board that will underpin that yeah. should the yeah. need arise. If I can't recoup that by the end of the season, yeah. so it's unbelievably hard. Right, we're going to have to move on. Uh, last week, reserve grade. There was a meeting in Brighouse, and I think it was a fair to say a step forward towards compulsory reserve grade coming back for Super League clubs and Category 1 academy clubs. Uh, Dave, I know you're a big advocate of, of reserve grade. How big a step is that for the sport, do you think? Personally, myself, I think it's an absolutely fantastic move. And I think it's been going it's been going in the right direction for a number of years. And I'm not going to sing Derek's praises too much here, but he was about five, six years ago, was it? Mm. When we had a reserve grade you know, over at Lee. Mm. Uh, and at the time, there was teams in the division like sort of Halifax, Lee, Keithley, Northumbria, I think it was. Mm -hmm. It was about five or six teams. And Sheffield, of course. And Lee actually stuck by it. And if you just turn your eye to the game this weekend, when you watch Wigan against Cass, did you notice the three players that came through the reserve system that were playing for that team? Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you name the three? Uh, well, Joe Bullock, Chris Hankinson. You'll have to give me the third. The third one was Corey Aston. Corey Aston, right. yeah. He's yeah. been playing for Chef and I think he's a fantastic player. Mm. I don't think he's got a good future in the game. But there's players out there that have pushed on. Chester Butt was another one who's coming through at Halifax, etc. We could name probably about 30, 40 between us. Mm -hmm. But you've got to look at like certain clubs that have really stuck by the guns as well. Wigan, Wigan have been superb about it. I know Michael's got the uh, reserve grade now and he's stuck by it. Hull FC have done the same this year. Keith Lee Blesson, they've done the same. But if you look at Wigan, for example, they're great believers in that, in that system. And I think they've done an admirable job. Well, this year they were going to go in and it just didn't work with the reserve grade this year. Mm -hmm. So I had a whole host of players, myself included, seven or eight players, we just couldn't find game time for. Mm -hmm. Like Sammy Kabula, Callum, Callum Field, etc., etc. We've had to find clubs for them. I've worked with Wigan to do that. Yeah. But I think what it's stopping doing, going back to the whole full circle of this thing before, we're talking about players leaving games and stuff. I think if we retain and we keep that system, that reserve system, in next year, for the next few years at least, maybe. What's going to happen then? I think it can only benefit clubs like Lee and Wakefield, et cetera, et cetera. But here's a big one for you. If you're talking it's mandatory next year to have a, a reserve grade, Michael, what happens to Toronto if they get up? Well, they haven't got a Cat 1 Academy. So at the minute, we're only talking about clubs that have got Cat 1 Academies having a mandatory reserve grade. Um, we dipped our toe in the water this year with reserves. Uh, we've got probably as much wrong with it as we have got right. Um, we've, I think we've overstretched ourselves to a point. Injuries haven't helped again, but I think we've overstretched ourselves. But this year will give us a really good grounding for what we need to rectify for next year going forward. I'm a big believer in reserves. I think uh, that the massive thing for us is that we've got kids in our reserves pulling on our badge to play for us. So, you know, and, and I think that that's massive that we're not farming them out to other clubs to go and get experience. There are the odd ones that we feel championship and league one rugby is, is better for them than reserve grade at the minute, but it gives us that option to mix and match all that. So Lee Kershaw out on Oldham, Oldham love him. He's had a, a fantastic Titus. experience. Titus is out there now. He's in his first year of League One. And he's, uh, his first words to me was, wow, how different playing against men. Mm. And that, So that's been the, the, the best path for him. Yeah. But we've also got kids that have just played reserve gear all, all year. We had a kid called uh, Elliot Kane, yep. who used to be with us, went to Swinton, has come back. Um, he's played for our reserves, loved it. Kid called Liam Senior, who's got a, a college degree, a university degree in chemistry or something like that. You know, really bright kid. 
just wants to play. Yeah. So, you know, we, we found options for them as well. So yeah. for us, it's all about what's the what's the best pathway at this moment in time for that individual player. And then we'll try and play some as such because yeah. we've still got dual reg with, with Newcastle as well. D Derek, so we've got a foot in every, every, every camp, really. That's Derek, good. I can only give you about 30 seconds on this. It won't be compulsory for you. Will you be interested in reserve grade next year or not? At, at this moment in time, our focus will be on having the strongest first grade team that we can have yep. to get the club back to Super League. Fair enough. Well, I absolutely do not know where the time has gone, but we are up <laughs> for this week's edition of Rugby League Back Chat. A big thanks to my guests, Derek Beaumont, Dave Pete, and Michael Carter. We'll be back for another edition of Rugby League Back Chat next week. Goodbye for now. Yeah.